Morning. How are you? Pretty good. Hi. Welcome to Bedford. Thanks. It's a surprisingly nice neighborhood or what place. You, what do you mean surprisingly nice? Uh, it means that I didn't expect that, which is obviously my fault because it was clear that it would be a nice place to stay. But You thought Bedford would be a shithole? I didn't expect anything. <laughs> it is, was much better than, uh, than the neutral position. It's the uh, home of Bitcoin in England. Congratulations. <laughs> the odds on tab of England. Okay, so listen, let's clear something up. British cuisine... Oh, we had a wonderful roast. <laughs> I knew you were going to ask answer. about it. But the guys, you had two roasts. No, I had only one. I had a burger. I was the wise man yesterday. You had the burger. Yes. Yeah. yeah. All uh, all the rest, we tried the roast, and it was terrible. I was thinking about taking a burger as well, and it was a first fo- uh, mistake I I did yesterday. Well, you had two hosts. You had one one for the morning or the lunchtime, and one for the evening. So you got to blame the hosts because the first host made the fateful mistake of taking you to a Green King pub, <laughs> which are notoriously shit. Yeah, you know now. (laughs) You know now. You want to go to the local non-chain pub with a reputation for good. I would say the issue, it's a cultural thing because I think he's like half Spanish. So, you know, he doesn't know his way around the UK. He knows his way around the UK. I'm not having that. Okay. I'm not having that. So anyway, how you guys been? We're good. Great. Yeah. Thanks. So I wanted to talk to you about hash, hash rate first because it's going a bit crazy. Uh, but just for anyone listening who doesn't know who brains are, what it is you do, introduce yourself, start with you, Jan, and then we'll move over to Pavel. One. Okay, my name is Jan Chapek. Uh, I'm one of the co-founders of Brains, and we've been mining Bitcoin since 2010 through Brains Pool, or formerly Slush Pool. And until now, we mined something like 1.3 mil of BTC, which is most probably going to be unmatched. Did like, you hodl it all? It's our users' money, which have been uh, distributed, so we don't hardly really own this amount. That's an incredible amount. Yeah. Well, that was easy at the, the beginning with the subsidy of 50 BTC. And now we're approaching next halving, next 2024. So it's probably going to be unmatched. Uh-huh. We've met a few times as well, haven't we? Yeah, we did. Uh, I think in Riga. Yeah, was that the first time? I think so. Yeah, I couldn't go last year. Um, I'm going to go this year, though. I'm going to try and get Danny there. I'll be there. It's a great conference. Yeah, I like it. Yeah. Um, Also, yourself, Pavel, introduce yourself. Yeah, my name is Pavel Moravet. I'm the second co-founder of Brains. Uh, We both have uh, different software engineering slash hardware engineering experience before uh, we created the company. But since 2013, we are full on on Bitcoin and Bitcoin mining specifically, all different aspects, uh, trying to utilize all the experience from before in, in the space. And so far, it's I, I could not imagine uh, having a career uh, more exciting than, than what we have. It's, it's a cool ride. So did you know each other before Bitcoin or was it Bitcoin? That oh yeah, you I think we about? met in our first job after university, like 2005. Oh, wow. And then uh, we kind of parted careers. Uh, I went for the embedded, uh, Linux embedded systems. Uh, and uh, Pavel will say what he did in the meantime. And I think we got together back in 2009 and we founded Brains 12, 20, 2011. But by that time, we were actually writing firmware for gemsets. Already? <laughs> oh, yeah. Psycho. So, so that, that actually came to fruition. Is that a word in English? Yeah, fruition. Fruition, fruition yeah. yeah. Uh, in Brains OS, because we used all that experience uh, in writing firmware for the mining machines. Wow. I think we, we uh, spent some time on salsa parties. Because I, I, I introduced him to dancing when we were in the first job. And then we, we kept seeing each other uh, in salsa uh, parties, basically. Um, Did you ever partner each other? Like uh, dancing together? Yeah. Uh, maybe. I think so, yeah. Um, it's it's quite interesting to, uh, to be a follower. we've got our Patreon bonus content. Yeah, we've got our Patreon bonus content. <laughs> oh, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to see you dance. <laughs> it's oh, a lot of years ago. But... You still got it, come on, man. You don't forget this stuff. Yeah, I, I think you, you should be able to do a lot <laughs> okay so who brought bitcoin to who uh mm, i think it was me 
uh, was approached by uh, Marek slash uh, Palatinus, uh, which is an old friend from a childhood of mine. And uh, he introduced me to Bitcoin. And when, when I thought about jumping in, uh, I didn't want to do it alone to do the same mistake what Marek did basically uh, doing a single person uh, enterprise. And in that time, we already had a company with, uh, with Jan. Uh, and I just wanted to have a, uh, a second person to, uh, to cover my back and be, be more like a professional in, in doing what was needed. Because in that time, uh, all was just a garage uh, thing. Uh, and, and yeah, so I was not in Bitcoin much longer because it was immediately obvious that uh, I just don't want to be alone in, in, in the space. And it was a super wise decision to, uh, to go to Jan immediately. And yeah, so what, he called you up and he said, listen, I've discovered this new magic internet money. I think, uh, I think we need to get into this. Actually, the story is slightly different in a way that the first time I discussed Bitcoin was 2011 and we went on a sailing trick. It was trip. It was me, Pavel, Slash, and some more people in Croatia. Yeah, and that's correct. the first time I actually met on a boating trip. Hey, yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you lose your Bitcoin? No, 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 no. Hold on, hold on. And, and uh, he was actually explaining about this like GPU mining, and he has these crates with uh, GPUs and, and stuff like that. And I just at that time I considered it kind of weird scheme. Like, what's the point? And uh, he explained the pool and everything. And it took like two years until we got the pool into the company. And at that time, I actually was sure that we we're actually late to the party. And now, 10 years later, <laughs> here we are. So like from that perspective, it doesn't look being late to the party. But at 2013, when I realized the, the impact of what we're dealing with, um, that was just like, well, that's, this is too late. Like everything is lost on business level, but you can actually still build business on that. So, yeah. Um, it's a learning experience for everybody. You can, you can feel imagine. being too late, but it, it's just a feeling. And with every cycle, you see, you see like new people coming in and they would think, well, I'm late. Oh, I don't know. It's good that you're here at least at this time. Yeah. Well, when, like I've had it a few times in the last couple of weeks because the Bitcoin price is recovering and you get those DMs or texts. So it's like, oh, am I too late for Bitcoin? It's like, I always say, like, if you're too late, if I thought you were too late, I would have sold all my Bitcoin. Yeah. So we got a few of them. Did you? Yeah, I did. Sold all my Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> no, I wish I had it for 69,000. But anyway, that's uh, for another day. Okay, so, and because and, I wasn't around in 2011. Well, I was around. I just wasn't in Bitcoin. I was being a moron somewhere. Um, there was a requirement for pools back then. But were there ASICs then, or was it still it, GPUs? No, no ASICs in that time. Uh, I think there were uh, first thoughts about GPU, okay. but ASICs, if I remember correctly, it's a long years. Uh, so it's still, still like CPU, partially, and and then 2012, 2013, if I'm not mistaken, uh, ASICs took over basically. And you were the first pool. It is said so, yeah. It is very difficult to say exactly because you cannot uh, go around and dig all the projects people made in 2010. Uh, but by all reasonable standards, yes. Claim it, own it. Uh, you want to be precise in saying such a statement. Maybe we can say we were the first pool also with the Stratum V1 protocol. Because before that, before the pooled mining, when the pooled mining started, uh, the protocol being used was something in line with how Bitcoin Core, how Bitcoin Node communicates with, with the miners that doesn't scale. And this needed some thought. And that actually, that thought is called the Stratum V1. We had to give it this attribute V1 later on because of the V2. Uh, <laughs> Surprisingly. <laughs> Surprisingly, but at that time it was just called Stratum Protocol. You were so confident that you only needed one version to begin with. It was, it was working 10 years. I think it's an awesome achievement. It's, like it still all the, works. All the Bitcoins, basically all the Bitcoins in the world ever would be generated by V1 protocol. Like the, the rest of the coins 
uh, uh, which are not yet mined, it's a it's a fraction. So most of the coins were like mined through Stratum V1. So it's I think it's decent. Yeah, that's pretty cool, man. So you should probably explain what Stratum V1 is because there's going to be people listening and going to be like, "What the fuck are these guys on about?" In simple terms, yes. it's just a protocol, a set of rules how miners, like physical devices, are communicating with a pool who distributes the work and basically organizes the mining. And the communication involves some obvious details about uh, what block is being mined and so on and so on. Uh, but the scale of mining globally is super large. It's a lot, a lot of uh, different uh, devices. And for mining to be efficient, so there is a lot of communication needed. So the protocol is designed uh, for allowing all this communication to happen in a reasonably efficient way. And so are other mining pools using Stratum V1? Everyone. Everyone's using it. Yeah. And you're cool with that? Of course. Do you get do you get a like, benefit from that? What do you what, what the that? main benefit of everybody using the same protocol is basically you as a miner, like entity trying to mine, you're not locked for using one single pool. You can you switch. can jump pools easy. Yeah, the, the interoperability is key because it allows you to make a decision about who is your pool provider. And this uh this feature is uh, quite important. Otherwise, you would be forced to like by by the protocol or some incompatibility would be forced uh, for using something specific and it's not uh, in anybody's uh, interest. The, yeah, interest. It yeah. balances the security in a way that you can switch over the miners between the pools. And there have been cases like this back in 2013, 14, 15, when some pools started growing too much and then the miners intentionally decided to switch over. Because there are incentives, like you, you want yeah. to prevent a certain pool to reach fifty-one percent. Yeah. Did um, has anyone tried to build a pool not using Stratum V1 and then realize it's not possible? I'm not aware of anybody. It doesn't make sense. Doesn't like, make sense. It's it's pretty simple to implement Stratum V1, and uh, the devices are able to communicate uh, by this protocol. So it, what you would have to face is. Uh, you can implement any protocol you like uh, on the server side, but then all the machines you would like to uh, get to your pool would have to uh, get a software update for talking to you, which you have no uh, no reason to do so. Otherwise, uh, it's just it's expense for nothing. Uh, yeah, the, the coordination for switching a protocol for mining globally. It's it's a big big task, which is something what uh, uh, we are trying to do with certain V two, but it takes a long time and a lot of effort on different places to synchronize the the rollout of something like uh, com like communication protocol change because you want to have both sides be ready, and uh, then you can start to use uh, use a new protocol. One side is not enough. Well, listen, we need to get into Stratum V2 because it's super important what you're working on here. Um, just before we get into that, like a super simple primer, anyone listening who's never, and who doesn't know what a pool is or what you do and why they're important, just just give the quickest TLDR on that. Well, I'll try. Um, so mining Bitcoin, it's sort of like rolling a dice, right? You have a certain task, you want to roll a number that's smaller than something. If you if you manage to do it, and if you think of your dice having thousands and thousands of sides, um, then it becomes a little bit more uh, computationally intensive in terms of like how many tries you have to do. And with the pool, uh, what turns out to be convenient is that your dice rolling, the more players are rolling the dice with you, so trying to mine the Bitcoin, uh, you still have the same chance, but you're experiencing what we call the variance, right? It can take you one week, it can take you one year, depending on how much performance, how much computing power you have, so how often you're able to roll the dice. With the pools, the concept is that you aggregate this dice rolling capability, the computation power, or we call it a hash rate, uh, into a couple players, and what that means, we reduce the variance, and then the rewards when when the pool actually finds the block, or actually the miner who finds the block, is 
uh, sharing this result with all the other miners and they get the proportional reward to how they participated in the round. Uh, it gets a little bit more complicated than that because there are also other schemes where miners are actually being paid directly by uh, each hash that they provide or each result that they submit. But this is this is uh, roughly it. Okay, so what you're basically share, saying is the miners are sharing the risk. If you if you yes. if you're mining on your own, the chance of you finding a block is very low. Yet you've got to spend a lot of money on operating your miners and maybe even your data center. But if you mine within a pool you're essentially sharing the risk and reward between all the other miners right. in the pool. Yeah, all Bitcoiners know that uh, a block is found each 10 minutes, right? Uh, but it's single block for everybody trying to find the block. Uh, so if 1,000 people is trying to find a block, you have, uh, they are of the same uh, computational uh, strength. Then you get it in 10,000 minutes. Uh, and the more miner, miners in the world uh, there is, uh, the, the longer expected time for finding a block yourself is. So uh, after some, some time, more and more computational power, it stops to be uh, smart because it can happen that you can find a block in 10 minutes really, but it can take weeks and weeks. So by joining the, the, uh, the performance, uh, you just decrease the expected time to find a block. Um, smoothing out the uh, the income you you get from the mining process, and this is the core concept of a pool. So miners are basically socialists. Uh, yeah. No, they're aggressive yeah. capitalists. They're <laughs> all after money. Um, okay, but you were hinting that there's almost two models. There's the model whereby if the pool finds uh, you know finds a block, it shares out the rewards uh, proportionally to how much hashing. But you've you kind of hinted that also. There are maybe services now that are just paying you for the hash, right? So the ones that are paying for the hash are they taking the risk their end? Yes, they're taking the risk on their end. Maybe a tiny detail in the pooled mining concept or in overall Bitcoin mining concepts, it's important to emphasize that you cannot like mine fractions of Bitcoin. Like you're you're mining the whole block of transactions, and that reward is given by the protocol. So currently, like six point twenty five plus all the fees from the transactions, and that actually determines like how long with your computation power. Let's say if you take your S nine that you have somewhere here, uh, probably uh, you can really make a, a pretty precise calculation how long it would take you to find a block, and you would not be happy about that number. But you at the same time you cannot mine on your own uh, like that little fraction of Bitcoin that you would say, okay, I'm going to mine for one day. But if you pull that resource with, with the pool, you put that computing computing power into the pool, that's the moment where you actually make, make it possible to mine fractions of Bitcoin. Because it's like, um, it's an analogy of like splitting up the, res the reward based uh, proportionally on your, on your result. And from that end, you can also say, okay, how much does a single hash cost that I submit? Uh, you're not submitting the hashes, but you're submitting the results that eventually hash to a certain target. So uh, then there is a certain price to this given by the current subsidy of the block. And then you can be actually paid by just providing the results. And the pool doesn't have to find the blocks. Obviously, at some point, the pool has to find a block or you have to find some blocks so that uh, the pool is not like net negative, right? Hmm. But it's, it's on the pool side who takes the risk. Do pools have any wider benefit to Bitcoin or is it really just a service for miners and it's completely irrelevant to Bitcoin itself? Hmm, interesting question. I don't think it has uh, Do you think any, I, I, any value other than for miners. But I guess what I'm getting at is, does the existence of pools increase the security of Bitcoin because we will have more Bitcoin miners because they've got less risk? Or do you think if there was no pools, then they would just all be competing and taking the risk? Hmm. If miners are forced to not use pools, I think it would be net negative. Yeah. Uh, but at the same time, uh, pools are not bringing any security. No, I don't say. mean. I, I don't think directly, but indirectly, yeah. they indirectly, lead to more yes, security. Because other, otherwise, most of the miners would be unable to operate the uh, the mining farms or longer term. Because the the chance of it, you, it would be just a casino. Somebody would get lucky, and a lot of people would uh, get busted. 
especially in the early days when the difficulty was rising up very crazy. Basically, like after 2013, there was the ASIC era, right? After CPUs, GPUs, FPGAs, then there was the ASICs. And the ASICs were not using the cutting edge chip technology. So they, the, the chips produced for hashing uh, were being obsolete within like a couple of months. So with your investment into the equipment, uh, doing it on, in a solo way, there would be no way to, to sustain that operation. So you would have to naturally pool your computational resources with the pool, with a pool. Uh, but at the same time, uh, I see it as, a, as another service. That's a business opportunity. Or at that time, that was a good business opportunity where naturally miners don't want to run the mining infrastructure because the pool is basically something between the Bitcoin nodes and the miners themselves. And it, it, is, it has its own challenges. It's basically a high availability system. Otherwise, you could lose money, right? Because we're talking about like now significant amount of money that is in each block as a subsidy. And you want to make sure that your software is correct. And this uh, is something that miners were willing to pay for in terms of the mining fee or the pool fee. Uh, and put this responsibility onto somebody else who sees it as a good business opportunity. Nowadays, the pools are like the, the the pool itself as a business is not such a profitable vehicle anymore. But some companies probably tie it with other businesses, yeah. financing, you know, and ties to manufacturers and stuff like that. Yeah, Harry Suddock talked to us about this what it's a couple of years ago now. Yeah, wasn't a while it? ago. Yeah, he he said the 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 pools will eventually trend to zero in terms of their revenue model and then maybe even invert and pay, actually start paying for uh, for people to mine with them. Uh, what is it that, is it anything that uh, pools can offer on their own that make them more competitive than other pools or is there no distinguishable features? It's really commoditized. Yeah. Like the, the, the main service is really indistinguishable from each other. There is not a differentiating factor be, be, between pools. If, we are talking about the pool service itself. Uh, the fee structure is one of the important ones. If you can check the, the mark for uh, trusting the, the party, like it, it's not, it was not always the case that you could trust the pool you were using. But if you can make this thing like so, then uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty much uh, the same service everywhere. Did any pools rug? Uh, like bankrupt or no, no rug pool their users. You're saying they couldn't trust uh, them. Yeah, uh, there are different options how you can steal money as a pool uh, in different schemes. Uh, oh, right, but uh, yeah, sometimes it's very difficult, obviously, to prove it. Uh, you have only some statistical evidence, typically. Uh, so th yeah, there are ways, and historically it was the case. I am not aware of anybody doing it nowadays. Uh, anymore. What were they doing? Like uh, uh, you, obfuscating you, some of the blocks they mined, just keeping the whole room. Yeah, you can play with the luck. You, you can, uh, for example, report more hash rates under management than you actually have. Okay. Uh, you can uh, not include all the uh, all the money which you should include in the, into the price. You can uh, not count all the shares properly. So you say, for example, I pay you X amount satoshis for X amount of volume of hash rate, but then counting the hash rate you provide to me, it's difficult to uh, check it from the miner's perspective. You have to have the infrastructure for counting all the volume you provided. So it's pretty simple to for, for the pool to skim just half percent of something and, and claim that, for example, I have zero percent fee. But if I don't count all the hash rate you're uh, uh, giving to me, then I'm not paying you for everything, basically making the fee however big I, 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 I want. Yeah, but that uh, should be pretty hard to hide really now because it's pretty yeah, transparent yeah. on what you should be earning. Yeah, yeah. If you have the infrastructure for doing all the accounting yourself as a miner, then you would, you would find out this yeah. on a particular, uh, particular pool. But it's not always the case that you have the infrastructure and it was not the case uh, throughout all the years. Because right. you just don't expect that there is there can be issue like this on a pool. You don't expect there to be scammers. Uh, 
yeah, uh, until until <laughs> somebody uh, say you that, hey, please like double check this because it, it can be a trouble. Uh, you you never know. And if you look at uh, miners, not everybody uh, is like highly professional uh, miner with. Uh, um, I don't know, specialists in, in uh, software writing these, these checking tools. Uh, it is not a common thing. Like lately, obviously, uh, the more industrialized the mining space get, uh, I guess this is not happening anymore because uh, the miners are like big uh, public companies and uh, it, would, it would be difficult to uh, break this uh, trust. Uh, but yeah. Yeah, it also then sounds to me like if this, if the the, the mining rewards eventually, um, like the commission that the pool takes is trending to zero, those that are now paying for hashes, it feels like they may be slightly ahead of the curve in that they're preparing for the scenario where there aren't, there isn't any kind of commission, any cut to take, and therefore they're preparing for it becoming a, a, a service they pay for. Yeah, um, there can be different motivations. Uh, we know that uh, there are companies operating pool as a loss leader nowadays. It's wow. something what you can do if uh, you can benefit from it uh, different ways. But from uh, like mining perspective specifically, it doesn't make sense, obviously. But in a more general uh, sense, yes, uh, we obviously don't do that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but so what, why would they do it as a loss leader? What's the benefit? Do you have some additional businesses or uh, products that you want to associate with the customers that you have on the pool side? So you onboard the customers to the pool, but at the same time, they could be tied to different uh, hardware deals. So the miners, you know, want to update their hardware, they want to build new farm, so they get this pretty good deal or financing or whatever. Uh, to make this happen, but the condition is that they stay on the pool. So you have alternative revenue stream. That's how we see it. Has any of the ASIC miners launched their own pools then because of that? Not necessarily because of that, but uh, historically, yes. For example, Bitmain is running uh, pool AGs already. Uh, and we did see some strings attached uh, to the hardware historically. Yeah. Uh, Again, the landscape is changing every few years. It is different, especially as uh, larger and larger uh, companies are uh, dominating the space. Uh, naturally, the, the landscape shifts uh, to more uh, standard business relationships, let's say. Uh, but yeah, we, we know about a lot of miners historically who could not switch uh, the pool because of uh, some agreements with hardware manufacturers. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's just sounds like hyper efficient free market, which trends everything towards zero when something is commoditized, which is, I think, Je something Jeff Booth would be a, a huge fan of. <laughs> okay. It's, it's the case. It, it takes years and years. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it, there's not a lot of uh, ways how to prevent this. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's talk about Stratum V2. Uh, I heard a first. I've heard about this for years. I feel like I first talked to Matt Corallo about it about three or four years ago. Does that sound That's about, about right? correct? Yeah, yeah, about three or four years ago, and it was we were having a conversation about pools and trying to make them become a little bit more decentralized. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna walk us through a few steps again, just to help people who who are listening. So people often talk about one of the biggest risks with Bitcoin is a 51 percent attack. Now a lot of people know what that is, but can you just explain what a 51% attack is? How real a 51% attack? Uh, how real is the risk? And then I've got some more follow-up questions. Well, the attack is about somebody aggregating enough hash rate and statistically, if, he, if he's uh, this one person above the half, uh, he is able to perform different kinds of attacks like double spends and stuff like that. But uh, aggregating this amount of hash rate in a single place, there's a strong incentive from the miners to disconnect from such pool in case... Uh, forget pool aside, it's right, just, yeah, just, yeah. A, just a 51% attack yeah, on the so, so, so this is what the attack is about. Like statistically, if you own more than half of the uh, half of the hash rate and it's just enough by one person, you're able to do bad things on the blockchain. 
You, you can force to, your your will to everybody because make your own truth. Uh, basically, new, yeah. N- new blocks are uh, it's a competition. Once you have more than fifty percent of a trade, you are in long term. You're winning. You're f- making the blocks as you like it, and you can make a different chain of blocks obsolete by building a different branch and making it longer than uh, the previous branch so that you can even invalidate blocks which were already mined. And it, it could cause a lot of troubles to a lot of businesses or uh, users of Bitcoin. So the, the problem is the, the like orphaning already mined blocks and basically forcing the well, picking transactions, uh, whatever you want, uh, or prohibiting some transactions to get into uh, like censoring transactions, for example. It, yeah. And is 51% enough to have a serious, to be able to cause some serious damage? Or it, could you? is it just like with 51%, you're just over 50%, so you can yeah, cause some it, incremental problems, but most it, of it, it will is get a found. Nu- it is a number which is just bigger than 50 yeah. You can attack. You could try to attack the network with lower than 50%, but it, it would be just uh, rolling the dice. Uh, for really making sure that you can attack, you would need much more than 51, uh, because otherwise it would be just a random chance if you succeed or not. And it would be super costly for you to implement the attack, because if you eventually don't win, you have lost 50% of computational power for nothing. Uh, so. To pull o- pull the the attack, really, I think you would need a bit more, and and there is a strong incentive for not doing so, uh, mainly because of the disruption in the whole ecosystem, which you would cause. Like once somebody is trying to attack, I think uh, the most probable reason why to do so would be uh, damaging Bitcoin, uh, not as a personal win, because once you would attack, it would cause so much trouble that you can easily expect to uh, the price of Bitcoin go super low or it, it, it would hit the price. So you as, a, as somebody who uh, put a lot of computational effort and therefore money into, into mining Bitcoin, you would harm your, yourself by the exchange rate uh, dip. So, you, so you're, what you're saying is the game theory is there's no economic upside for somebody to uh, rewrite blocks, double spends. But there is uh, a, a, an alternative economic benefit to someone who has a desire to destroy the network. That's the only. If he wants to act irrationally, yeah. yeah. So, so th- this is uh, like extension of what Jan said. Uh, miners who value Bitcoin, and typically miners are uh, like the first line of Bitcoiners as well. Uh, they have a natural uh, incentive to protect against fifty-one percent attack by switching to different pools to not disrupt the uh, the, the space uh, because they would be harming their income, uh, which is kind of nice direct incentive, right? Yeah. If we imagine two scenarios, there is a, uh, a mining center, just bear with me for the moment, well, one miner, one public miner who manages <laughs> to accumulate 51% of the hash rate uh, versus, say, a, uh, a pool that uh, can... Uh, um, that has 51% of the hash weight, can they cause the same damage or is there is the pool in a slightly different scenario? It's a bit different uh, in the sense that uh, in case of pool, uh, you as the owner of the machines connect, uh, connecting to the pool, you can change your mind and say, screw you, I'm going to connect to a different uh, pool and then uh, y- you can prevent uh, the pool to have 51% to uh, make the attack happen. Once there is a single entity deciding what to do with 51% uh, hash rate without anybody, uh, anybody's consent, then uh, it's more serious uh, situation to be in. And didn't we, is it back in 2013, was there a miner who was getting close to 50%? 51%? It was a pool historically. Is it a pool? It, it was, a, it was yeah. a pool. I'm trying to remember, remember what that was. I think they went over 50%, whoever it was. Let me find out. I, I feel it like it started with a G. G H I O. Yeah, yeah. G-H-I-O. yeah. That was it. Yeah. yeah. And that exactly followed was followed by miners disconnecting from it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So what does Stratum V2 do? Well, maybe let's talk about what 
what are the deficiencies of okay. V1, yeah. and that kind of comes to a conclusion why we want to have V2. So uh, it is a saying that the most frequent, or maybe a question, what do you think is the most frequent, let's say, protocol sentence of the original protocol? It's called mining submit, like anytime, anytime a miner sends uh, a result, a share, uh, it's always prefixed, uh, it's a textual protocol. So when you read the dump of the protocol, you see mining.submit, mining.submit. So they're like wasting bytes just because the protocol is textual. So one thing is the inefficiency of the original protocol because of the the format that has been chosen for it. It has been chosen for specific reasons because mining protocols are generally a uh, very sensitive thing and you want to make sure that they actually work. So that's something we uh, eliminated uh, and this inefficiency has been taken away basically by switching to what we call a binary. So the protocol is now much more efficient in this in this sense. Second, uh, what that means, we shrinked the, the messages and allowed uh, certain types of mining messages where the work that's being distributed to the miners is smaller than what it has been previously with Stratum V1. It's called header-only mining for the readers or listeners. It can be Googled. Then if you look at the security aspect, Stratum V1 didn't have any official security layer. So all the protocol was completely clear text. So if you tap into the line or if you happen to install a virus onto um, miners router, and at, in these days when it all started, it's been all like home mining, like, you know, mining started, the original idea was one CPU, one vote, right? So you were supposed to mine Bitcoin in your home. And since the protocol was completely plain text and unencrypted and unsecure, uh, you could actually steal the hash rate without even noticing. So the security aspect has been addressed uh, also in the in the protocol in the in the new version two. Uh, then we can talk about some other inefficiencies. One of them that is being uh, quite often addressed is this case with the empty blocks. To explain this. A uh, mining machine is something like a racing engine. You have to run it at full speed all the time and basically give it work all the time. What happens when uh, there's a block found in the, in the Bitcoin network? Uh, it takes seconds and seconds to actually generate a new template for the block. So it's convenient for the pools to distribute an empty block that can, that's a, or empty block template to the miners. Uh, which is available like immediately. And in the meantime, the pool can work on the new template and immediately distribute a full block. Uh, we tried thinking... Uh, oh, if- hold on, hold on. So let's slow down on this one. Okay. okay. <laughs> what you're saying is, is that it's more of... By distributing an empty block, they've got a higher chance of them finding another block afterwards. Yes. Right. But it's not, it's not the case that after they found one block it's then efficient to do another empty block afterwards, consecutive empty blocks. Uh, it is. Oh, it is. It, it, it works. Uh, the, the problem is uh, full block contains a lot of transactions. The transactions needs to be validated that uh, to, to uh, build a proper block with all the rules mm-hmm. uh, matching. Uh, once a new block is found, the first thing, what it needs to be validated, accepted by the network and so on and so on, uh, you know the hash of the block, which is needed for a construction of the new block. It's called prev hash, previous hash. Uh, you can immediately have all the information for the new block if you don't include any transactions. If you want to put two megabytes of transactions into a new block, you need to p- uh, pick which transactions in which order would be constructing a valid block. It takes some time It's and it's how much non, time? Is it still seconds? It's like seconds, really seconds. seconds. It's not like and and then then you have to distribute this information to to miners. So what is typically done is once you detect a new block, you know the prev hash, you immediately send the empty block template because the miners can work one two seconds uh, prior to get information about the full block. So what the pool does is it it tries to immediately uh, build a template for a full block with all the transactions, all the validations done and send the work after. But there is a non-zero chance that somebody would in the first or second uh, second find a block. 
and that's why we can find an empty blocks in the, in the network. So it's t essentially two miners finding the same block at almost the same time. If you mine it empty and they're building the template, you're going to get that block out quicker. Yeah, uh, because it's it's a huge statistical game. There yeah. is just a non-zero chance that even the first hash you're trying to make would, would generate a block. So spending two seconds more on a, on a new job, uh, it's just beneficial. If you like, it's thirty it would seconds, be three hundred seconds uh, in between blocks, right? So how, how many empty blocks are there a day, or what percentage are empty? Not a lot, not a lot. But uh, it, it should match roughly one in three hundred. One in three hundred. Because t typically, if you have one second delay in distributing the work, and the first second you would be mining empty blocks, and from the second second you would mine full block, then the expected number of empty blocks would be one in three hundred. Oh, okay. I'm trying to understand. So, so are they building the template? Is everyone building the template before they've actually found the bl the block? Or is it the second, they uh, find uh, the block and then they build the on template? On top of the new block, because you need uh. the... But maybe maybe to complement this, and the V2, it's actually uh, in the proposal, what we are thinking, is it possible to actually construct a template, even though we are currently mining on top of a different block, but this template would contain some, let's say, less expensive transactions that are in the second part of mempool. That's the general idea. And you can distribute this template up front to the miners. And when a new block is found, you can actually quickly validate if this template still makes sense. And you either tell them, oh, here is a, an empty block, please start mining on it, or empty block template, or please use the uh, template that I give you previously, that I've given you previously with the less expensive transaction because it's better than empty, right? So, yeah. so the idea so what, the what idea. Saturn V2 uh, brings is uh, it allows you to speculate how the new block found anywhere in the network would look like. And you can speculate about what the next one, what transactions would be in the next one, what you can include there. Uh, and because there, there is an incentive for putting uh, pricier transactions into the block, you can discard the most... Uh, efficient, the best transactions, uh, and expect that they will be found in the in the next block. So that you pick less uh, price transactions. You speculate. You can distribute it uh, to miners. And once uh, a block is found, it's a simple simple check that your speculation was correct or not. And you just pick uh, the, the the right one and say to miners, go ahead and and mine with this, which. Um, decreases the delay uh, and miners can immediately start to work on a full block, uh, not uh, not an empty one. Hmm. You, you just said there, you just used the language of the proposal and it just made me consider something. Uh, if all pools are using Stratum V1 and, and hopefully subsequently Stratum V2, is, is Stratum a brains product or is it something that's actually owned by the community now? We gave it to the community, and there's actually a big open source movement behind it already. Great. And we're like part of the discussions, but uh, we intentionally didn't want to be like the company, like whose protocol it is, because it's more important. And again, we can go back to the incentive game, right? It's it's in our best interest as the participants in, in this Bitcoin computer game, let's call it like that, uh, for this to be successful. So in our best intentions, it is to have a, a protocol that we think is secure, but definitely not controlled by one company. You don't really want to be in a situation where you're dictating what Stratum V2 should be, maybe suggesting and everyone works together you, on it. You cannot force yeah. people to use it then. It's not a product. Yeah, It's a like honest attempt to improve uh, very key aspect of Bitcoin. Yeah, I love and that. And one one of the like most most frequently uh, spelled out feature of V2, which is at the same time the most complex ones. Like the the protocol is complex. It's it's gonna take some time uh, before enough people would implement it because all these features. It's super simple to do it like di directly, but it has some consequences of, uh, on the quality of uh, mining process. So once you start start to eliminate these small inefficiencies, you pay it. You pay for it by 
an increased complexity of the protocol. So it will take some time. Uh, but the, the most interesting feature, uh, but at the same time, the more, most complex one to implement is something what is called uh, job negotiation, or uh, it, it basically re reverts uh, who is uh, deciding what transactions are uh, being put into a block. So far, it is pool's responsibility to construct the, uh, the block so that the power of censoring transactions or picking transactions, it's centralized in pool's hands. Uh, and this feature is not really a nice one uh, because of uh, pools being quite centralized entities, right? So what is the end goal for V2 is uh, allowing miners uh, to build the block themselves, but at the same time use the uh, the money aspect of pool mining when you are you you got a decreased uh, variance in of the income, so the money would be still the same, but the transaction selection would be distributed, therefore uh, more secure for uh, for the whole net network. Distributed also. amongst who? Amongst miners, among the physical owners of the machines. Uh, so it, it's not something what would solve the problem of single entity owning machines having 51% uh, fishing power. But uh, pools are much more centralized still than uh, the mining companies or miners. Mm -hmm. uh, so giving the, the authority or capability to miners would strictly increase uh, the security in this sense. Very cool. Hmm. And so were you working through a list of things? There for Strata V2. Uh, that was pretty much it. That was pretty uh, it. So the security, but maybe to come to to demonstrate how the current state of things is, uh, it's been like publicly said like Stratum V2 is a concept, but that's not actually um, a concern. Co a, it's a concept. Oh, but, concept, yeah. But uh, it's not in operation. But the fact is that we have prototyped the protocol and drafted it probably like three years ago. Okay. And we actually used it for our product for the Brains OS firmware to to prove that we can we can exchange uh, or switch to a completely different uh, mining protocol stack. And now when the when the open source community took over, they're like cool guys and they came to us. So we're like, okay, uh, why do you guys chose this? Because uh, when, we, when you look at the security part, it's encrypted and it's authenticated encryption. So that means uh, when you look into the communication, you cannot tell like what's in there. And if you touch any byte, like try to tamper with it, it's the communication doesn't break down. It detects that it has been tampered with. Uh, but these guys came to us and we're like, okay, uh, this concept using the noise protocol for those who use, for example, Signal or WhatsApp, the noise is a standard for, for secure communication, kind of like TLS on, on, on the web. Uh, they were like, let's let's change, uh, let's use noise, but let's let's change the encryption uh, scheme because we want to use the same uh, we want to use the same algorithm when we talk uh, when we have miners talking to the pool and when we have uh, miners talking to the Bitcoin D because they're creating some Bitcoin D extensions and wanting this to be uh, consistent. So like. The prototype that we're running, they actually obsolete. They were like, that's good because that's make a final baseline of what is going to be the V2 when it's like like publicly released and adapted by majority of the players. And we'll just go, we're just gonna switch and fix our stuff. So this is this is uh, to demonstrate that it's a real thing. It's it's happening. It's been it's been used on like hundreds thousands of devices on our end in terms of the firmware as a proven technology. And now the community is building uh, open source code base uh, that should be the baseline for for everybody to adapt eventually. So what is the timeline for people to be able to upgrade to V two? Uh, can they do it now? On the firmware side, then. I, I can say, okay, you have to use our firmware, then they're on V2 already. Um, we were in discussions with uh, some of the manufacturers. They like it, but they're still like waiting what's going to happen. Uh, I cannot probably speak for the timelines because like technically uh, the code base is ready. I think it, it probably waits a little bit on like the final call saying like this is the final spec. But when anybody goes to stratumprotocol.org, uh, and reads up like on the state of things, it you get a pretty full picture of 
uh, what's happening there. So when and, you say and, on and the firmware, sorry, just to back up a step so people yeah. understand, is this the firmware that sits within the ASICs? In the, in the miners. In the yes. miners, yes. okay. And does each manufacturer have their own firmware? That is the case. So each manufacturer therefore has to, currently uses uh, Stratum V1. That's correct. Yes, that's, yes. that's the case. Like, uh, it's more slightly more nuanced than this. You can start to use Stratum V2 for a connection to a pool, even with devices running V1, because you, what you can uh, run in your operation as a miner is a translation proxy from uh, Stratum V1 talking to devices and Stratum V2 talking to a pool. Uh, so it, it is possible and it is a probable path forward because like expecting that all the machines in the world would upgrade firmware and uh, it, it's just infeasible. So there is a hope that uh, newer versions of new machines coming to market would nat natively support V2. Uh, but even if it's not the case, uh, still by using a, a, a proxy in your operation, you could as a miner, like the entity, uh, start to use benefits of Stratum V2 for talking to pools. But it's kind of a chicken and egg problem. Like it, you, you have to have an endpoint to connect to by the new protocol. Uh, so pools need to uh, support it, but pushing pools to support it, if there are no clients uh, having it because they cannot uh, connect to somebody with V2 easily, it's kind of a chicken and egg problem. Yeah, so it I, takes some coordination. But it's ideally, difficult to say. we want, we want uh, Stratum V2 to be the default for everyone like Stratum V1 is, right? There's no benefit to staying on V1. Yeah, I think... I think the turning point will be uh, when the open source version is good enough for somebody running it in production and somebody implementing the job negotiation on top of that, which will make uh, an interesting difference, at least from marketing perspective, even if you don't believe it's a good idea. I think it's a good idea to just be the first who do, who do it, but, and then it will force uh, other competitors in the space to, to follow. Um, how long it will take, uh, it's difficult to predict. Is, is there anybody who's vocally or actively against Stratum V2? No, no. not really. And is there I, any... There are people saying it's, it's not needed or it's just forever a theory. Uh, not happening anything and so on and so on. But I didn't hear any like direct complaint against the protocol itself. It's just... And what about the pools? Is there any incentive for them not to adopt it in that they are... As far as I know, I think there's already a couple of pools that do implement it, even though the spec is not stable yet. So it's good that they want to be ahead of this because the tiny things that are going to eventually change in the protocol are small fixes that they would have to do, but they would be ready for this. Hmm. So I know about at least two pools. And just to you, just to go back over the points you've already made, just so I'm 100% clear, what is the part of Stratum V2 which makes uh, the mining more decentralized and de-risks the pool being able to 51% attack? Uh, job negotiation. Just job negotiation. Yeah. That's All it, the right? rest is uh, increasing efficiency on different uh, levels and like the security of uh, preventing stealing hash rate. The encryption is, is uh, great as well. But the most interesting feature is the fact that uh, miners could influence the content of a new block and not letting pool to decide about this. That's the D feature. Hmm. Do you think there'll be a Stratum V3? Hopefully not. <laughs> Hopefully not. <laughs> Considering <laughs> or at least the hassle. I'm, I'm not, I'm not <laughs> going to, true. like if, if I have a like, machine and I can go to history, I would probably tweak uh, we to to slightly different shape after having the experience of uh, f from the last few years, uh, people implementing it, people not necessarily understanding the the concepts behind that. It's quite a complex protocol. I would probably make it slightly different, but it's not uh, it's not such a big deal to create a new protocol. It's like by far no. Has it has it been stressful then? 
frustrating. What's been frustrating? Uh, after years of running a pool and experiencing all of different issues uh, coming from V1, you have a, a, a specific mindset. You have some insights into how it really works, what are the edge cases and how, how to deal with them. So you try to uh, project the experience into a protocol, right? But just reading the specification doesn't give you the insight. So people were not always uh, catching the reasonings behind uh, some design decisions on the protocol, which you can blame yourself for not explaining everything in the specification so that everybody understands. But uh, uh, the talks about ex explaining the reasonings by some, some of the uh, features, it, it, it takes just a long time. And has that therefore ended up being a distraction from running brains? No. Not really. Not really. It, it makes you realize, like especially the latest changes in terms of the security and the encryption protocols. I was like, well, that you could call a distraction, but at the same time, you realize it's important that the, the consensus is unified like, about the technology that we're going to use. And actually, the last options you have, because technically you can make the protocol like very flexible using different schemes, but you want to be simple uh, for any future changes or whatever. So that that's what that's what you could call a distraction. But at the same, I think it's I think it's to the benefit of the protocol itself. Uh, maybe to to add to this, uh, I don't think there's going to be V3 in a way that now this is actually the first mining protocol that is as has the ambition to have an official specification. Unlike Stratum V1 original, when you go to the internet, you actually have, you will find a lot of dialect and you have no good clue what's the single source of truth for the protocol. So there's no single spec and uh, there are like so many dialects implemented by different software stacks that uh, that's something we that we had to deal with on the firmware side, on the pool side, because then you know, you have new firmware coming from the manufacturers uh, and then it doesn't comply with your pool. So this has been a big hassle throughout the years. And that's one of the reasons to have finally something formalized. So, and this formal specification can evolve, can evolve and change eventually. It's it's ready for, yeah. for making changes, even though nobody would be happy about some some major changes, but it is possible. So that's why it wouldn't, we would, hopefully we would not have V3. Okay, amazing. Well, look, the third film in trilogies are always shit. Anyway. <laughs> okay, so we'll think, stick to the second one. I think film, yeah, that, that's the reason. <laughs> they always peak at number two with like Alien 2 and Terminator 2, <laughs> Superman 2. Nice observation. The Godfather. <laughs> Every third film's shit. The Godfather 3 is shit. It's true. Superman 3 was shit. Terminator 3 was shit. Alien was Alien Three. Oh, that was okay, but the ba basic, yeah, basically the, the, the trend is pretty clear. <laughs> Although the second one usually is the dark one. <sighs> Superman Two was pretty dark. What about like uh, Lord of the Rings? If they made already three, it's the third one. Shit They're, all well. shit. They <laughs> They're all shit. They're all shit. Okay, <laughs> I hated those films. Ba ba based on you, a Lord persons. of the Rings fans. <laughs> yeah, I didn't like them. I did enjoy the the original books yeah. a lot. Uh, I don't have like troubles with the films myself. Uh, it's probably going to be my most controversial take, telling Bitcoiners that I think Lord of the Rings is shit. <laughs> going to lose some uh, Is there any consensus followers? about about that in the community? I don't think so. I don't know, man. It's... Like you, you cannot say anything against meat. Obviously, that no. this is more. Uh, controversial than Lord of the Rings. I'll back you say. up on Lord of the Rings, though. Yeah, They're fucking really bored. So. <laughs> and do you know what the first thing was? So we are, uh, you're not on enemy, that. enemy territory now. <laughs> yeah, because do you know what the worst thing about the Lord of the Rings was? After you watch the first one, you're like, oh, well, I'm going to have to watch the second one. <laughs> Sit through another five hours. Yeah, and then the third one. Oh my God. That was so boring. It's not, it's not my kind of film. I'm more of a. I don't know. Casino man, Godfather. Okay, so that's a good lead up to why the fuck is uh, hash rate going so crazy? Well, um, we had the bull run right before. <laughs> There's a little bull run, and that's uh, that's the time when everybody gets crazy and starts buying machines, but it takes time to manufacture them. 
especially with today's silicon, you have to grow it. It takes months and months. So now this is the machines that are eventually being shipped. What? What? What a second! Hold on, you have to grow silicon. Yeah, it's it's yeah. actually the analogy to. Did you know this? I did not know that. Yeah. You have to grow silicon. Uh, yeah, you. What's an organic substance? No, it's it's an organic it's an organic substance, but it's it's a good analogy. Like if you grow crops, because you cannot speed up the process by having more money or whatever. It's like. It has distinct stages. You take a raw piece of silicon and then you put one layer of the chip on it and then you grow another layer and so on. And it has, let's say, 20, 30 layers. And the more advanced chip uh, process technology it is, the longer it takes. And if you have, let's say, micro earthquakes in those regions where chips are being manufactured, you have to redo the round again. So it's a process that takes a lot of time you cannot speed it up too much. You can speed it up in a way you're you're running in parallel, but you have still some limited capacity, right? So it's an interesting thing and almost a point where you could uh, commoditize the chips because you can place your futures for growing your silicon for the Bitcoin mining machines. Huh, okay, I, I'm going to be honest. I don't know shit about chips. Like, what do you mean you grow this? Like, like how does a chip it, it's, work? It's, it's just... Uh... A procedure of layering the layers of a, of a silicon on different uh, layers of the chip, and, and it is so optimized to be so small and efficient that you cannot speed up the the single steps. The there is like thousands of manufacturing steps going into every single chip. Like okay. obviously, you do it uh, wafer by wafer, where there is thousands of chips, but the wafer to pro, to be uh, like from the raw wafer to to chips, it takes months because of like all the steps take a lot lot of time. Are chips designed and built specifically for the device, or a chips generic and the device like itself the is process, built around it? The process is ge generic, but uh, the chips for Bitcoin mining are specifically designed okay. uh, for Bitcoin mining, it, and it, it uses the latest and greatest silicon industry uh, silicon uh, technology what you can get basically so these miners keep making the same mistake there's a bull run they raised loads of capital they suddenly put in a massive order and then by the time the order's ready we're in a bear market whereas if they raise all that money and said let's just wait 12 months they wait 12 months and then they could just buy all the asics that all the broke miners have got on yeah, the chip. But you, you would have to invent uh like s some machine telling you what's gonna happen in in the next six 12 months yeah, which called, you, typically you don't have you do it's called the internet and you look at the history of bitcoin <laughs> and every four years uh, okay. it does the same thing yeah but, but but then from this perspective they are making the same mistake again and again in uh, like but it's it's quite natural right uh there is a if, if there is a bull market yeah everything is this time is different cheap to get money yeah for mining so what, what do you typically want to get as much orders as possible because then you can put a press release hey guys owning our stocks or want, wanting to own our stocks we are big boys we will have that amount of uh, hash, hash rate, rate in yeah. the future which is obviously good but then uh it's not single order it takes time to build it so the more money uh you pour into it typically it, it takes longer to deliver so and the delay is uh, severe so the, the current hash rate is still uh, a product of, at least in our opinions, uh, it's still a product of the massive orders put uh, in the moment when it was understood as a good idea. Uh, so you don't think there's any nation state mining going on? No. Not in large scale? Uh, Ooh, I don't believe so. Well, so do you think there's some? I would uh, say so, probably to the east of Prague. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there is. I'm sure some governments. I, I, this. I do not enough. Do not know nothing. Well, we don't have any data right? for this. Uh, but it's true. It's just a speculation. Hmm. But maybe to add to this, uh, why the hash rate is going through the roof? It's also important to realize that the machines that we had before were built on a different technology. So let's say. A private generation miner was somewhere between 50 and 70 or heavily on our clock, like 80 terahash. And the new machines are like 
basically double of this hash rate, mm. the latest XPs. So it's not just the amount of machines in terms of number of pieces, but uh, also the, the hash rate of each machine is like 1.5 to twofold bigger than what it was before. Yeah, and one, one more So that amplifies is, it. Like the efficiency goes, uh, goes up, meaning uh, the same energy we consume for mining generates much more hash rate nowadays if you follow the, the technological curve of like newer machines. Um, so yeah, it's quite natural that hash rate goes up and it would be very surprising if this would stop. It would mean some quite severe issues with uh, the whole ecosystem or Bitcoin price. If uh, a listener looks at the historical charts, it is basically ever ever growing curve uh, with exceptions like uh, ban of mining in China, very, very black swan event. Uh, and then it just went up. So it's not surprising that a trend is like this, uh, especially the last bull market, a lot of public companies raised a lot of money, unprecedented amount of money. It was mm. not the the previous bull, uh, bull run the same. Right. Okay. Okay. Um, when I was out in uh, America recently, as you know, I made a film on mining. Uh, I was in Texas, Oklahoma, uh, dipped into a couple of other states. I think it's Arkansas. Is Arkansas a state? You went to Texas, Canada, didn't you? Which is like on the border of the yeah, three, I think. Yeah, I should, I should know that. Arkansas is a state, isn't that? That was Bill Clinton's. Yeah. State. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think in Mississippi as well. Uh, and I got really close to mining, the closest I've ever been before. Rather than just like the exposure through the pod and doing some mining myself, I actually went to facilities and saw mm -hmm. different facilities, mm -hmm. saw home miners. What was the experience? Well, the, the experience was broad because I saw everything from home mining to institutional mining. But I also, yeah, I hooked up with Marshall Long at the end when I hung out with him. And yeah. uh, what I realized about mining that was super interesting is there is no room for ideology in Bitcoin mining. It is cheap power plus efficient operations to ensure that you have margins that are profitable. Uh, yeah, I met a lot of people on there who actually don't care about Bitcoin, don't know even own Bitcoin you know, who work for mining mm -hmm. companies. Um, but, but again, my experience was there is, it was the area of Bitcoin, uh, the area of Bitcoin I found that has the least time or room for ideology. Mm -hmm. uh, interesting. Yeah, which was, I thought was super interesting. I, the competition is very tough. Yes. It's very tough. And uh, the whole incentive structure drives everybody to be really as efficient as possible. Otherwise you, lose the money you invested in. So to survive, uh, you're naturally forced to be as efficient as possible. Uh, I don't think there is no space for ideology, uh, but surely uh, it, it is like efficiency driven, execution driven uh, in, in most of the cases, yeah. Yeah, that's not to say there was no ideology. That's yeah, not to say yeah. I didn't meet Bitcoiners who have a Bitcoin ideology, but yeah. It was more focused on this is what I think Bitcoin is. This is why I think it's useful. Not in that you should be this human, and mm -hmm. if you don't do that, you're not a Bitcoiner kind of thing. It wasn't kind of like oppressive ideology. It was just more kind of personal. Do you remember the Segwit Wars or Hash Rate Wars? Do yeah. Okay, and that was that. I was very new then, but that's that would seem to be ideological. But when you looked at the details, or uh, in in my view, it was not just about the ideology, but about specific reasons uh, that you could lose some, let's say, advantage when mining Bitcoin. That was the ASIC boost affair at that time, where nobody knew that some of the machines already had this improvement, but there was no like counterpart in the mining protocol for it. So they had to find a, well, they, their way around it. And I mean, Bitcoin will never will never uh, confirm this or acknowledge this. I would say, but uh, their firmware and their machines were capable of ASIC boost when only a selected groups of people were able to use it. So, and, and it would seem it's ideological. Like, do we do segwit? We don't do segwit. Blah blah blah. But it's like you want to have the advantage. 
to huh. to the rest of the mining world. So, do, do you think this is why Jihan supported Bitcoin Cash because he wanted to maintain the ASIC boost? I wouldn't go like it this far. It would be a strong claim. That would be a strong claim. But uh, when I look at it just technically, uh, do you remember those voting bits in the headers? And it was like flipping. Do you know who I am? Yes, you appear here, right? <laughs> yeah. But anyway, so 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 at that time there was yeah, something no, like and, voting me, there. Me and Danny at the time, like, what the fuck is this in the headers, <laughs> dude? That's like way out of my uh, comfort zone. But anyways, uh, you could technically use these voting bits for SegWit, yeah, for uh, for the ASIC boost. And we have a theory that it was being used for that. Huh. So it was like flipping back and forth, back and forth, and so on. What was it like for you guys during the uh, SegWit Wars? Were you always small blocks or was there ever a time where you're like, oh, well, this kind of makes sense? Because I was. Like, first time I was like, oh, this, I was so new. I was like, yeah, it makes sense to have bigger blocks because this would be great for business. It'd be like, but then it was like, yeah, and it makes sense for smaller blocks because of decentralization. I don't know which it is. I was the... I wanted to go with the Bitcoin core philosophy, so like, don't make like stupid changes that might look very attractive. But if you don't understand, because Bitcoin is about understanding the whole protocol, Bitcoin protocol, and that I don't speak uh, about like how the nodes talk to each other, but the, everything that's encoded into the software, how how the blockchain behaves. Uh, so I was on the conservative side, but I was at that time. I personally didn't care much because I was busy with this stuff. Like I was researching like technically how to do ASIC boost and what what's what's the deal with it. So that was very exciting times for me at least. How much more efficient were the machines with the ASIC boost? Or? It was like when the moment like I remember that night when I when I enabled it in, in the lab and you would see like 15% drop in consumption. Like fifteen percent of energy that you could use in hashing. It's not like proportional, right? Because if you Let's say I want to I want to use like I want to like overclock the machine proportionally. You would also have to tweak the voltage a bit, so you will not get like fifteen percent of more hash. But you either instantly saving that energy, or you can overclock and use that extra budget. So that's a, that's a comparative advantage that somebody for sure had and was using it, even though he or she was claiming. Do, so is this something someone figured out to get the advantage, or do you think there's a possibility? The disadvantage was programmed into it. No, I, I th the, the way I think about it is that uh, let's say you were to design a new mining chip, yeah, and you would know that there is this this possibility to have this optimization. So you would have both features in the chip, saying like the straightforward way of mining and the ASIC boosted way of mining, uh, and you would sell machines with uh, the straightforward way of mining to uh, your retail customers and the selected customers would get the boosted machines or you would just keep them for yourself to, to have this advantage. Okay. And because at that time the S9s were like the, the, the top of the notch, like the best the best machine ever. And we don't know who was using it. It was definitely Bitmain, but we don't know who. But well, definitely it was Bitmain. <laughs> sure, but they they will never say it loud, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, and the the efficiency difference is extreme. It, you can compare it to like imagine you're mining on a pool and it takes 15% fee. You would get the same uh, same results as was the difference enabling or not enabling uh, this this feature. So they basically made everybody uh, like throw away 15% of uh, of revenue. Yeah, throw away. Yeah. Yeah, and so the software you've written that miners can include, is that your own kind of ASIC boost? Uh, it's our own invention. We just yeah. started the whole firmware project. Like at this at this time when we discovered this feature, uh, we were like, we have to do something about it, and that somehow overlaps with the history where where we were uh, like. Coincidentally, working on a firmware for a machine that was like ASIC boost only, and we're like, we have to do something on the mining protocol end. So Stratum V1 at that time, I think it was like 2017, 18, something like this, uh, got an extension to actually allow like um, over uh, covered. What is the other one? Like the open, basically. You're you're saying I am doing. Yeah. Uh, you're you're doing the overt. Uh, 
uh, ASIC boost. Mm. So we, we made the change in the protocol to allow this and then implemented the support in our firmware at that time uh, for the S9s as well. And then basically everybody adopted it. And ASIC boost is like natively supported in the V2. So, yeah. so, so everyone has your software on their mind now. <sighs> I wish it they would had. be great. It would be great. It's not us. the case. Really? Even, Why it, not though? Like, how many people are we talking about? Like, what percentage of the market do you think you've got? Single percent. What? Like digits? Single. Something single, like this. But yeah. there's literally no downside to them using your software. It's all upside. Yes. Is one of the issues that it can void the warranty on the ASIC? Uh, it can be, uh, it can be trouble, but at the same time, a lot of machines, most of the machines are much older than what the warranty period is. Yeah. Cause it's typically like six months or something. Uh, if you are a strong player, you can make, make maybe make, uh, better conditions, but I don't think that's the, uh, main trouble. Like it's quite a technical topic and the decision makers are, are not always, uh, like understanding big enough picture to make a, make a choice. Uh, and there is, we can see a disconnect between uh, people doing decisions and people running the operations and understanding the, the lower level uh, aspects. There can be a lot of other business related reasons which we possibly don't understand, but like from like simpler perspective, it's just, it gets you uh, more hash rate or uh, what's the percentage efficiency <laughs> based on uh, based on the device older uh, devices could get 15 percent 20 percent more hash rate um, so you can increase increase their Bitcoin income by 20 percent yeah and, and for for some models yes or you can save 10 percent of uh, energy on different machines either way it's a no-brainer yeah, so it seems like a no-brainer. Like it, it's not all such such easy. The uh, support for machines is not always uh, created in uh, like at the same time. So depending on the models you have, uh, some models can be uh, supported a bit later. Um, you have to deal with a different uh, firmware as well. So if you are uh, used to uh, talking to the machines, running some firmware it can be slight technical differences, but in general, it's yeah. yeah. Stop, making, ex stop deep, making excuses for yeah, people. They should yeah. be doing this. Huh. I, I don't. I don't get it myself. I'm just trying to find uh, reasons because, from bigger picture, it's a nonsense to not use uh, the capabilities of the hardware. And currently, vendors are not using the hardware as efficiently as they could by uh, their firmware. We try to fix it. Um, so it's everybody's decision if it makes sense or not. Hmm. And then if everyone did it, there's no advantage. Uh, it's basically racketeering. <laughs> well, you should, you should be the running your machines at the most efficient of course, yeah. uh, level. It's like, why spend, why spend all that time trying to get the cheapest power Trying to run the smartest, yeah, right waste ten percent. It's just well, especially on Bitmain, the, the, the difference is big. But uh, maybe again to draw the whole picture, back in two thousand eighteen, everything was like rainbows and unicorns in terms of you technically own the machine because you could install whatever you wanted on it, regardless of the warranty. If you care for the warranty, then you would probably you wouldn't do it. But this has changed. And nowadays, when you actually buy the whole machine, it doesn't feel like you really own it because the firmware that's on there uh, is basically locked. So they will not let you to log into the machine and do whatever you want with it. But also, you are not able to boot an alternative firmware easily because it's using a scheme called Secure Boot. So essentially, the machine or hardware level checks if the image that you want to load into it is signed by the manufacturer. So in an ideal world, we would like to have a deal with the manufacturers and becoming sort of the endorsed aftermarket, whatever firmware yeah. provider at some point. But that's very difficult, you know, to deal with. I don't us. know, man. I'm a salesman. I reckon I could do okay. this for you. Yeah, I would just get out there and see them. You'll get a nice cut. Hey, man, if I had the time, I'd get that out there and sell that for you. This is an absolute mm -hmm. no-brainer. Like, Sounds good. Hmm. <laughs> uh, so when they... <laughs> this is our... 
our struggle for such a long years. It's one thing to bring a nice solution, a technical thing, what makes sense, and a completely different thing is to sell it. Yeah, I'm a salesman. I'm, I don't get the technical shit, but I can sell it. Yeah, we, we, we complement each other in this exactly. sense a lot, I there guess. You <laughs> there you go. Well, uh, we'll share some ideas on that. Uh, so uh, when you say they lock it, but have you still found a way around their locks? Yeah, and uh, we cannot <laughs> talk about it there. publicly. No, good. But there is some like magic. and. Magic oh, into that. It just works somehow. Or it, uh, or let's say the the solution is not ergonomic as you would expect. For example, it requires an SD card to be plugged into the machine, which is fine for a home miner, but is not and doesn't scale for a big operation. Like we're able to produce like twenty thousand SD cards. That's not a problem. But like if you if you count the cost for like just sticking the SD cards in and making sure like every SD card works, that becomes prohibitive for big farms. So, I mean. If you, even if you have solution in some ways, uh, and so for some of the machines we're stuck with this. For some of the machines we we do have a solution that can be like remotely installed. For I example. still think at ten to twenty percent it makes sense. Sure, yeah, there's a strong incentive for that. Mm. Interesting. Yeah, ba basic arithmetic should win in this case. It's it's a fascinating business you guys are building. Or have built, That's true. continue to build. Yeah, yeah, it, it is. Uh, very nuanced. There is a lot of small details, troubles everywhere, but at the same time, uh, you're participating in something what really makes a difference or it, it makes sense. Like that, the whole mining aspect of Bitcoin is sometimes like overlooked. It tends to be technical uh, for a lot of people, uh, too technical, but it's the foundation. Like without mining, like the mining is. The distinguishing factor uh, in a different like money schemes you you, you can uh, create. If there is no mining, the the biggest sim uh, single difference of Bitcoin to everything else disappears. The mi mining brings uh, the capability of uh, distributed consensus. Love With, it, man. Without it, it so it, it is something what has a big. Uh, idea behind it, but at the same time, it allows you to work on a lot of small technical details and trying to push it further. So you get both of the uh, of the worlds too. Yeah. So yeah, it's it's nice uh, to work in in mining. That was a very profound way, I think, to kind of bring this to a close. Uh, is there anything I've not asked you about that you wish I had? Ask me about this book. It's free. What's that, free, <laughs> what's that free book you have over there? This free book is an intro to Bitcoin mining. It can be downloaded from our website and you can have this copy if you want. Bitcoin mining handbook. And we, I think we, we have it in Spanish and English translation. This is amazing. So that's like for the beginners to get the, the concepts. It also shows like the, the solar stuff and wind, alternative energy sources, uh, the economy of... Uh, running the miners Jesus. and it's a collection of our blog posts so we, we actually on the conferences lately we haven't been giving away t-shirts but the books and the books feel really good like how many, how many of these have you got question hundreds how many you got here in the uk right now probably like 20 let's uh let's give them out put them in the goodie bags that's a great idea yeah yeah we got a goodie bag for our event oh it's a shame we haven't got 30 well, fuck it. Some ten people, ten people just, get unlucky. Yeah, they get unlucky. <laughs> oh, cool. Yeah, but that's cool. Yeah, we'll give them out to people at our event. Oh, yeah, that's good. Yeah. I'm going to make my son read this as well. Get them into this. That's very cool. Thank you. Okay, listen, if uh, any miners out there who aren't using their software, who should be using their software, are listening and want to get in touch, they'll speak to me. I'll sell them that shit. No, where, where do you want them to go? <laughs> Brainscom. Brainscom. And I'm on Twitter. Follow us on Twitter. Any, any way how to contact us. If somebody is interested, we will pick up the, uh, the contact and, and go forward from, from that. It, it's not difficult to get us contacted. Yeah. Well, listen, congratulations. I think it's clearly, not only have you built an awesome business, but you've built really important stuff for Bitcoin. And your roles in the history of the development of Bitcoin and the pools and everything you've done, it's incredible. I mean, you've created something that's had to go out and be open source to a community. I think that is incredible. Uh, I appreciate you coming in. I'm looking forward to visiting your country in June. 
is it seventh to ninth around there? Six, seven, eight, something Six, seven, like that. Yeah, we're going to come to uh, we're going to Prague, come and drink some good beer. Good beers. Yeah, come and hang out. So I'm looking forward to that. And thanks for coming all the way to uh, the the home of Bitcoin in uh, the UK, which is Bedford. Thank thanks you for, for having us. us. Thank you very much.